If everyone can take their seats, we're going to begin the first panel. Please take your seats in the back. Thank you very much for your patience while we prepared for this first panel. Before I uh, make an introduction, I do just want to point out and thank our sign language interpreters here this morning, uh, Sylvia, Sylvia Moore and Beth McClay. Can we please have a hand for them? It is a lot of hard work to do that all morning, and, and they're always here for these events, and we very much appreciate them. Uh, this panel features five individuals who will discuss the role of religious liberty in their own lives and in their own communities. It is my privilege to introduce the moderator, DOJ's own Kerry Kupek, who will in turn introduce and welcome the panelists. Ms. Kupek currently serves in our Office of Public Affairs, but she has a long history of working with religious liberty organizations before joining the Department of Justice. We are privileged that she has agreed to work with us here at the department and to lend us her valuable time here this morning. Kerry, thank you. The panel is yours. Thank you, Jesse. Good morning. It's such a pleasure to be with you here today and have the opportunity to facilitate a conversation about one of my favorite topics, religious freedom, with people who have had experiences with religious freedom in a very tangible way. But before I introduce our Citizens of Faith panelists, I'd like to first lay out the framework for this panel and ask the question, what is religious freedom? Some would say that at its core, religious freedom is the ability to peacefully speak, work, and live according to one's faith, according to one's deeply held beliefs, and according to one's conscience, without fear or threat of government interference or punishment. As the Attorney General so aptly said earlier, let's face it, we wouldn't even have the opportunity to have this discussion today in the Great Hall the United States Department of Justice had not people hundreds of years ago come searching for a place that, will, that would allow them just that. I've heard it said, and I really like the way this sounds, and I think it's true. America did not create religious liberty, but religious liberty created us. However, I think in our culture today, it's easy sometimes to think of religious freedom as some attenuated principle housed within the dusty parameters of the Constitution. And in recent years, it's become a highly politicized phrase. I've even, even seen the phrase religious freedom housed in scare quotes, as if it's not a real thing, or even worse, as if it's a bad thing, which is tragic. True religious freedom is a beautiful thing. Religious freedom is our collective identity. Religious freedom allows us, all of us, to be who we are. And how does it do that? by protecting us and freeing us. As Archbishop Kurtz was saying, allowing us, giving us that freedom, that space to serve. So in the first part of this panel, you will hear from individuals who will tell you about their legal battles where religious freedom ulti ultimately protected them or those they were defending. In the next part of the panel, you will hear from individuals where religious liberty has allowed them, freed them, to serve their communities that same faith that drives them to worship is that same faith that drives them to serve those in need. And lastly, we will have the opportunity to hear from the panelists collectively on their thoughts on the road ahead, both in their respective spheres of work and influence and their message on religious freedom for all of us. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our panelists today. And I would just ask that you would hold your applause until the end. Directly to my right, we have Rabbi New. He's the director of Chabad of East, Bo of East Boca Raton. This is Jack Phillips of Masterpiece Cake Shop. He's the owner of Masterpiece Cake Shop. And of course, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Masterpiece Cake Shop Supreme Court case that we will be discussing a little later. To my left, we have Harpreet Singh Mocha. And he is the, community, he's the national director for MASA. And that's part of our community relations service here at the Department of Justice and he'll be telling all, all about what that work entails. Further down the panel, we have Kelly Clemente. She is a volunteer with Bethany Christian Services. That's a faith-based adoption agency. 
And last, but certainly not least, we have Derek Max, and he is the co-founder and principal of Cornerstone Schools, which is located right here in Southeast Washington, D.C. Would you join me in welcoming our panelists today? <laughs> Rabbi, let's start with you. You are the director and spiritual leader of Abad of East Boca Raton, as I just, as I just mentioned, with over 4,000 centers worldwide and 1,200 in the United States alone. The Chabad movement is the largest Jewish religious, educational, and social organization in the world. But your journey with religious freedom begins long before your litigation battle to build your synagogue in Florida. So take us back to your grandparents in pre-World War II Poland. Well, first of all, good morning, and thank you for having us here, and thank you to the entire department. I grew up actually down under in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, in a family of immigrants on my mother's side from Russia, my father's side from Poland, both having escaped poverty and, and persecution. But I grew up in a culture of where the emphasis was on perseverance and on the pursuit of liberty and particularly religious um, liberty. And um, I came to uh, the United States in 1985 to attend the rabbinical school in Brooklyn. And uh, the Chabad movement is a very pioneering movement by nature. Um, we seek to establish with sort of uh, rabbinical startups, entrepreneurs, and we seek to create Jewish infrastructure in communities where there may not be one or whether it's, or whether it's weak. We are, we are not typically um, hired by congregations. So um, I came to uh, Boca Raton, Florida in 1999, which is actually also the year I became a uh, United States citizen, um, and came to an area where of the city, which is the coastal area, um, where there wasn't much in terms of Jewish uh, infrastructure. And then take us to, so and your grandparents were in Poland, yeah. and talk to us about why they left. So on, on my grandparents on the Polish side, um, they were dealing with poverty, but the winds of war were starting to gather. Uh, they had family already in Australia and were able to migrate. The borders were open and made to seek uh, a better, more prosperous um, life. Um, but they became pioneers of the Jewish community in Australia. My mother was born and raised in Russia and suffered firsthand from the persecution of, of communism, any public display of religious observance in uh, Russia. Um, you know, was, was a good opportunity to give you a one-way ticket to Siberia, if not worse. She had to struggle through going to school and not attending on, on Saturday, and the family was persecuted um, for that. But I have to say that, you know, the, the, the culture and, and the stories that I grew up with were not dwelling on, um, on the negative side, but the opportunities that, that free countries give us and to be able to pick up the pieces and, and reestablish ourselves and become pioneers for a, a better and more just and more equitable world. So your pioneering spirit that's in your family took you to, of all places, Boca Raton, Florida. Right. But then you got, uh, but then you faced a challenge that you probably didn't expect, and that was a fight to build your synagogue. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, I, you know, Australia is a liberal democracy, but I, I, as a naturalized uh, American, I will say that um, you can sense being in this country that this is the beacon of freedom. This is the air of the United States is freedom and, and, and religious freedom. And from here it emanates to the entire world. Um, so we established ourselves in 1999 and in 2007 we were ready to build a permanent edifice. So we had uh, put together an assemblage of land on a sort of arterial road that abuts in a, a uh, residential neighborhood but where there were two churches. So there was a church just to the south and just to the north of the assemblage of land, so we thought that would be an appropriate place for us to establish a house of worship. Um, and so we drew up plans and I called a meeting of the neighbors to reach out and to share what our plans are. And um, you know, that, I guess that was very, turned out to be a very fateful evening because uh, what I thought would be building bridges very quickly turned very hostile and a very grassroots opposition movement was, uh, came out of that meeting. Um, and the very next morning, there were signs throughout the neighborhood, save our neighborhood, um, very ominous. Um, neighborhood meetings were um, called together, 
but when members of Al Chabad tried to attend those meetings, they were excluded. And um, the end was that the, the, the neighbors organized in a way that they lobbied the city to create a parking ordin ordinance that made it impossible to build what we wanted to build and actually made any house of worship currently built non-conforming with the current zoning laws, but just grandfathered in. So we had to, unfortunately, abort um, those plans and, and regroup. Um, the city eventually passed a, a zoning ordinance in which a house of worship is a permitted use on commercial. So we pursued a commercial um, piece of property. Um, and once we submitted plans to that, which was seven years later, deja vu, signs all over, you know, save our neighborhood, or save Boca beaches. This is much closer to, um, to the Save beach. Boca from your well, fill congregation. In, fill in the blanks, yeah. you know. Um, and so litigation was brought against um, the city, which eventually approved our plans after a very, very rigorous, um, contentious approvals process, what many in the press consider to be the most contentious approvals process in the, in the city's history, given the fact that the, the area in general is not the tremendous development and the size of our buildings, like 20,000 square feet next to tremendous uh, condo buildings that are going on, um, proportionately our project was actually the smallest but ended up being the most um, contentious. Eventually the city approved us and then litigation was filed against the city both in state and in federal court. Um, fortunately three times in federal court the city has ruled in our favor. That's, it must have been shocking for you. You, know, you. you told me in a previous conversation that you know, your grandparents saw the writing on the wall in pre-World War II Poland, which is why they left. Yeah. And then your mother in communist Russia. And now here you are in Florida, of all places, right. and you have groups who are saying, save our community, yeah. as in an effort to block the building of your house of worship. Yeah. It was sobering, I would say, demoralizing. But you know, there's always cracks of light. And I, and I must say that at that very meeting, um, the priest of, uh, of the parish, just to the south of where we were going to build, came into the meeting, saw what was going on, and spoke up in our defense. He actually said that the land that the church was built on was donated by a Jew, and that as a community we had a you know, sort of a debt to pay to the Jewish community, and he was taken aback, excuse me, by the opposition. But I have to say that I think overwhelmingly the community is um, supportive, um, and that's really been um, the uh, the thread of, of light throughout of this is that it's, it's galvanized um, a lot of support amongst the faith community and amongst um, people really all over the country, actually. Hmm. It's, it's quite the story. And Harpreet, your parents also emigrated to the United States, but certainly not from Australia or Russia, but they came over from India. Your father was in the oil business, and so, not surprisingly, he uh, settled your family in Texas. So tell us about your experience there. Oh, he was a doozy. <laughs> uh, uh, first, thank you for having me uh, on this panel. I really appreciate it, and I welcome. I see many familiar faces, uh, friends, and associates. Um, that's right. I was uh, born and raised in Texas, and uh, it was the 70s and the 80s. And um, at that time, there weren't many Sikhs, and my family um, at that time set up a Sikh worship center, which is called a Gurudwara and uh, with eight other Sikh families to try to teach the next generation a little bit about the faith and what have you. But there was quite a few challenges to get the funding and get that uh, together. But in addition, what we saw is that as uh, political unrest um, was gaining in Punjab, where the province where my uh, family had come from or immigrated from, we, had, we would see a lot more folks coming to our Gurdwara. And as part of the Sikh faith, Sikh men wear uh, beards and turbans, we uh, cannot cut our hair. And I would see uh, many individuals uh, come for the first time, they would introduce themselves. And then a week or two later, they would look different. They wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't have the turban on, they would uh, have cut their beard or what have you. And it, I was, you know, early teenager and it always boggled my mind what you know what was the reason for this sudden change uh, was it some lack of conviction or what have you but at the end of the day it was about earning a living and um, many of those people could not find jobs 
um, and were point blank told that they needed to uh, remove their articles of faith to get employment or gainful employment. And you were and, too when and, you went. Yeah, and so, you know, and I always saw that that was a motivating factor and that I wanted to do something about to spread the awareness of uh, a religious freedom that we have in this country that we could still practice our faith and, and be gainfully employed and um, and so yeah I had always seen that and I would I saw that as an opportunity that I want to do something in this field and it motivated me to go to law school and then and also intern at the EEOC and work on cases with a Sikh community and then um, moving on to when I graduated after law school um, um, I was looking for a job like a new graduate would do, and we had a family friend um, that was a, a very successful attorney in, in, uh, in Houston, and he had called me for an interview, and I was really excited. I wore my best suit, you know, matched my turban and my tie, looking all sharp as I can, and, you know, had my resume and thought, hey, this is, I think the likelihood of this is going to be good. So I walk into the interview, and um, everything's going really well, and then the interview goes to me. He goes, Harpreet, um, you could probably start here in a month, but you're going to have to lose the hat and the beard. And I looked at him, and I go, excuse me? I mean, I thought maybe he was joking around with me. And he was, he was clear to the point. He goes, no jury in Texas is going to take you seriously with your turban and beard on. And I was like, uh, uh, you know, I go, I come... I mean, at that time, I realized this wasn't a joke, and I, uh, out of due respect, I said, I disagree with you, and I go, I come with a complete package. This is who I am, or I don't. And he goes, well, then, you know, I wish you the best in your endeavors. Instead of being down or negative, that kind of motivated me more that, hey, I want to get into this field and work on this, and so that motivated me to um, uh, work at um, and join a Sikh advocacy organization called United Sikhs. But prior to that, 9-11 um, happened. And boy, that, that opened my eyes. And, because it was always, uh, until that interview incident, it was always, I would see this happen to others. And it didn't affect me. But 9-11 affected everyone. And then uh, on September 15th, when I heard about Balbir Singh Sodi being murdered in Mesa, Arizona, uh, that really, touched a nerve, and I thought that I can't sit on the sidelines anymore. I really have to roll up my sleeves and jump into this. And so that led me to join uh, United Six and then to take on these cases, and there I flourished, and um, uh, we did uh, uh, many cases regarding uh, job and employment discrimination, but we did a lot of work in the school bullying area, and um, bullying um, the Sikh Coalition did a report a couple of years ago, and they reported that 64% of Sikh children are bullied across the country, where the national average is somewhere around 32%. So we had done those cases, and we had done two really egregious cases that really, again, uh, were kind of like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. And I think the first one was one in New York where a young man was bullied, and the bullier would take him to the bathroom and somehow lure him and beat him there and repeatedly. And I think the final incident was where the, the bully had a pair of scissors and forcibly cut uh, uh, the sick young man's uh, hair. And that really you know, alarmed us all. But again, I saw an opportunity that what can I do here? What can we do to work with the Department of Education, that school district, that community, um, the New York uh, school district, and we did a lot of work there to provide training, and we even formed the Civil Rights Department, DOJ. And then I think the second case that we did was um, the one in New Jersey, where uh, during a fire drill, um, a sick boy, and sick boys usually wear a smaller headdress called the butka, and uh, um, a fellow student had a lighter and set his butka on fire. And so that was the second case that we had done that uh, caused, a, uh, caused a lot of cry and who, and we worked very closely with, at that time, um, with the Community Relations Service, where I currently work, but also with the Department of Education, New Jersey, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice, in providing education, training, and just overall awareness of uh, the Sikh faith. Though uh, Sikhism is the fifth largest religion in the world, 
um, many people do not uh, know about the faith. And so it's kind of it's a, a learning cor curve. So you have to kind of start from the basics about who these people are and then talk about things. But I think uh, uh, you know, working on those cases and the hate crime response has always been near and dear to me. So that has always been a reoccurring theme uh, over and over. Yeah, it's amazing how what you've experienced and those you've helped has really shaped and driven you to, uh, like you said, provide education and training and services. And we're going to get back. We're going to come back to that in a little in a little later. And now we're going to turn to another case, uh, a recent Supreme Court case, Masterpiece Cake Shop. And this is Jack Phillips, as I mentioned earlier, the owner of Masterpiece Cake Shop. But Jack, before we get into the details of your case, let's talk about your background for a bit. Adam Lubtak of the New York Times did a feature pay piece in your case last year. It was on the front page of the Times, and he began, he began the piece with the following statement. Jack Phillips bakes beautiful cakes, and it is not a stretch to call him an artist. Talk to us about your journey as an artist, as a creative professional. Yeah, I saw that article, and I thought that's really quite the compliment, because as a kid, um, I was always drawing, painting, doing those kind of things. That's how I filled all my free time. Um, I, when I got into high school, you got to choose elective classes. It would always be in the art room, drawing, painting, whatever free time would be spent down there, because that's just what I like to do. And then when I graduated high school, I needed a job. And a man that lived across the street from me owned a large wholesale bakery. And he was gracious enough to hire me. And uh, I went to work for him in this bakery. And after I got acclimated to working for a living, you know, work two hours and take a break, and two hours and punch out for lunch, that kind of thing, I realized that I really, really enjoyed working in the bakery. I liked the people. I liked the pace. I liked the product. It was something I really knew that I could do for a long period of time. And then after a couple of years, he bought out another bakery and brought in a cake decorating department, which is something I'd never seen before. But then when I saw the cake decorating and the baking, I knew that I could combine those. And I knew someday I would own my own bakery, but it would be a cake shop. And I knew the name right off. It would be Masterpiece Cake Shop. Masterpiece says art. Cake Shop says cake. You knew you'd be coming in there, and hopefully the cake would be the canvas, and you would enjoy the art that I created on that. So just went from there and started saving money and put away um, money to open the bakery. I knew the, the logo of it would be, it's a painter's palette with a French whip and a paintbrush. And that also ties together the, the art and the baking aspect of it. I, I've heard you say that when you were in high school, you would have to, you, you know, they, you'd have to write a paper, which yeah. is standard, and then... For me, yeah, the 10-page uh, term paper would be nine illustrations and a map. That would be you know, how I'd try to get back. And so uh, as you... Um, you developed professionally, and you got into the got into cake decorating and, and designing and artistry. It was around this time that you had a very a spiritual experience, uh, where you came to faith um, mm -hmm. in a in a strong way as a Christian. And how did your commitment to follow Christ during that time change the way you operated your business, um, or affected the way you, yeah. you ran, ran your business? I came to Christ faith in Christ before I opened the bakery. But it changed my life dramatically in every aspect, the way that I uh, wanted to raise my kids and treat my wife, and then knowing that I'd open a bakery someday, how I would you know, treat my employees. And, um, it also helped determine what kind of cakes that we would do. My wife and I sat down at the beginning and said, you know, these are the products that we'll create, these are products that we can't create. I included um, cakes for Halloween. I uh, didn't want to celebrate Halloween, and that's... That's a huge um, financial decision to make because in the cake business, graduation is the biggest business, business, biggest season of the year, then Christmas, then Halloween. But to decide not to do that was a, a you know, tremendous, tremendous financial uh, decision to make. But we had decided which ones we would do and which ones we would forego. And, that my faith shaped all of those decisions. You keep your shop closed on Sundays? Keep my shop closed on Sundays. Um, we also had opportunity to do wedding cakes and deliver them on Sundays, but no, we won't do that either because I won't force my employees to work on Sundays if I'm not going to. I've also heard you say, I've seen it in interviews when you've said that uh, you don't do cakes that uh, have 
disparaging messages towards others. You don't do bachelorette. You have a, you have a whole yeah. string of things that you don't yeah. do. Halloween cakes, uh, anti-American cakes, cakes that would disparage people in any way, um, including people who identify as LGBT. Um, just it's the message of the cake that um, I evaluate, not the person ordering the cake. So because you've gotten requests that disparage people, including those who yeah of the LGBT community. I had, you know. One instance is I had a, a man that wanted me to make a cake, basically telling his boss that he was a jerk. So I wouldn't do that, but I've also had people ask me to do cakes that would disparage gay people in the gay lifestyle. And I'm just not going to do those either because they're hurtful cakes. So you, you owned Masterpiece for many years, and, but then in 2012, things took a turn. You had a, a gay couple came into your shop. They asked uh, you to create a custom wedding cake to celebrate their upcoming marriage. Uh, you politely declined. You said that you would, you in fact, offered to sell them basically anything in their yeah. in the shop, but that you wouldn't be able to do that ultimately because of your faith. Um, they they ended up suing you, uh, and they won at the Colorado uh, Human Rights Commission, and the Colorado Court of Appeals affirmed that decision. The Colorado Supreme Court ultimately denied taking up the case. Uh, so, but then, but then, the Supreme Court decided to take your case. And where were you that day when you heard the Supreme Court was going to take up your case? Well, the Alliance Defending Freedom went ahead and filed a petition with cert to the United States Supreme Court. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't hear very many cases. I'm sure you all know that, but uh, they get uh, presented with seven to 8,000 cases per year, and they take about 70 or 80. So 99% of them are denied. And the assumption kind of was that my case would be one of those. Um, but it was first conferenced, which is where they decide which cases they'll take or not, in October. And they didn't do anything with it. And every Monday then, from then on, I was pretty much watching SCOTUS blog, which I learned about a site where you probably all know, but it's a site that follows the US Supreme Court. And so I'd be on my computer every Monday morning, 7.30 Denver time, to see if they denied it, accepted it, or put it off for another week. And just kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And finally, the last week of the session, I'm watching my computer and wondering if maybe they might even put it off till the next session. But there I saw on their Masterpiece Cake Shop has been granted. And I honestly, just like this, I, I really couldn't breathe. I mean. They accepted my case, texting my wife, texting my daughter and my sisters. The only one I had to really share it with was a homeless guy who comes in the shop all the time. I say, hey, I get to go to the, uh, I get to go to the Supreme Court. He says, yeah, I got to go to court on Wednesday. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I don't need a parole officer. <laughs> so yeah, to be granted, that was really an honor. It's really an amazing thing. And the, and the Supreme Court ultimately uh, ruled in your favor in a 7-2 decision on free exercise grounds. Yeah. And the Department of Justice weighed in on, uh, I, with your position, mm -hmm. and, and, so, and, and that was a, a significant religious liberty victory. But in writing for the majority opinion, Justice Kennedy said that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission displayed clear and impermissible hostility towards your sincere religious beliefs. And what he was referring to was when one of the commissioners at the original hearing for your case he uh, called your Christian faith despicable rhetoric and analogous to supporters of slavery and the Holocaust. What was that like for you? That was surprising. It was stunningly insulting, really. Um, I serve everybody who comes in, in my shop. In fact, the two men that came in my shop that sued me, you know, I offered to you know, sell them anything in my shop. I'll make you birthday cakes, other custom work doesn't matter what your orientation is, it's just that I can't do this cake. But for the commission to compare that decision to not violate my faith to especially the Holocaust was particularly personally insulting because my father served in World War II. He landed on Normandy. He fought across France and Germany. He got a Purple Heart because of a mortar attack. They sent him back to England, patched him up, sent him back into combat in Germany, and he finished the war there. But he also was part of a crew that uh, um, 
liberated one of the first concentration camps, Buchenwald concentration camp in Germany, and for this commissioner, the chairman of the commission, to compare the decision not to violate my faith and create a cake portraying this message that was so antithetical to my belief about marriage, comparing that to the Holocaust was just such an insult. And that wasn't the only dark moment that you faced during your five-year court battle. Yeah, um, so we serve everybody, but we also, when I started out, wanted to excel in wedding cakes because to me, a wedding is a symbol of a marriage to come. It's one of the most important relationships that any person can be in. And uh, um, for the commission to deny me to be able to create the cakes that I choose to and be able to decline to create the ones that I didn't want to because of my faith um, was very hard because they ordered me to start creating these cakes or stop making wedding cakes. And the weddings were about 40% of our business at the time. So it was a huge financial hit to uh, drop that wedding business as well as the people that worked for me at the time. We had about 10 employees. Shortly after that, we were down to four, including myself. And so it was really difficult to try and stay in business at, at that time. Um, right away, we started receiving hateful emails and letters and phone calls to the point where I started answering the phone all the time instead of the girls that I had to do that because the calls were so vicious and vile. I figured, you know, I would handle all that. We had death threats, including one where man called me and told me where he was in town, he was on his way, he told me what he was going to do, what streets he was on, what time he was going to be there. And he even knew somehow that my daughter was there with my four-year-old granddaughter, her daughter. So I called the police and had them go hide in the back of the shop until the thing was resolved. Um, there were times where my wife was afraid to come to the shop just because she didn't know what kind of situation there would be. Some really, really dark times. Very dark. Um, and I know that you also received a lot of support, too, and um, I've, I've seen the images of, of yeah. people coming to your shop and lines out the doors and wanting to support you during this time. And I think, um, you know, one thing that you've always been very clear about is that it's not about the customer, it's about the message. Correct. And, 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 that, and that was a real pivotal theme, I think, even in the briefing in your cases. We're going to come back to your story a little bit later. Now we're going to turn to the second part of our panel. We've talked about religious freedom as protector, and now we're going to talk about religious freedom as freeing us uh, to serve communities, to serve those in need, as, as Archbishop Kurtz was so, uh, has, has said earlier. And so we're going to start first with Derek Max there at the end. <laughs> Hello, Derek. So you've worked at the Arthur DeMoss Foundation, Cato, and the American Enterprise Institute. You've also served as a staff economist on the Education and Workforce Committee in the US, U.S. House of Representatives and as a speechwriter in the U.S. Senate. But then 18 years ago, you started Cornerstone Schools of Washington, D.C. Why? Well, from a young age, I felt called by God <clears throat> to serve the poor. As my faith grew deeper, I realized that that wasn't just a calling, it was a commandment. And, and the one story that kind of, you know, decided, made us decide to do a school was I, I was tutoring and mentoring a young man named Deontay uh, who struggled in math. He was in the sixth grade. And it, you know, every week I'd get to him and I'd say, you know, let's go over your math homework. And he'd say, I don't have any math homework. I don't have any math homework. Got to be August, September, October. I don't have any math homework. Got to be November, almost heading into Thanksgiving. And I said, Deontay, I'm going to go to your school and I'm going to ask your teacher, you know, what you have for math. And he said, go ahead. Uh, now I had to go to his school. So I went to his school. I walked in and I, I remember going up to his teacher. And I said, sir, you know, this is Deontay. You know, I've mentored and tutored him for several years. And, he tells me he doesn't have any math homework. And he goes, that's right. And I said, well, surely he has math homework. He said, if they don't give me a textbook to teach it, I don't teach it. So that was kind of the impetus to me to say, you know, Deontay needs to be in a school where they're going to do everything they can uh, to make sure that Deontay uh, is prepared for life. Um, and so that was kind of the impetus to start the school. And 95% of the families who send students to your school are below poverty level. Yeah, um, we're in east of the river. Uh, we're not in Anacostia. There is, uh, there are neighborhoods in, in southeast that are uh, uh, not Anacostia, but we're we're by 37th Street, 
uh, Fort DuPont Park. 95% of our students are low income. Uh, most of our students uh, come from single parent households. Uh, almost every student who comes into Cornerstone uh, enters two grade levels behind. Our mission is simple. It's to provide a rigorous education to these students uh, that's Christ-centered and prepares them for life here on earth, but also life eternal. Uh, our prayer is that they learn to lead and serve others in light of Christ and his truth. So, how do, so uh, considering uh, I'm sure that private school is expensive, and it's a fully private school, so how do families afford to send their children to your school? Well, there's two ways. One, the, the government passed a program called the Opportunity Scholarship Program, which is a voucher program that goes to somewhere around 2,000 students of low-income families uh, in Washington, D.C., and about 60% of our students get that. The other 40% get the, the DC, get the Cornerstone Scholarship, but we raise money uh, to provide uh, funding for them to be able to afford our school. see a lot of lawyers and ties in here, so you can go to our website, uh, sponsor a child, uh, and make it a difference in their eternity. So what makes Cornerstone unique? Well, I think fundamental is that Christ is at the center. I mean, you can go to a school where you're told all these things not to do. Um, you know, I, I kind of, especially with violence being what it is today, do you want to go to a school where your, your, your classmates have been told when they wake up in the morning to think, I'm not going to hurt anyone today, I'm not going to bully one today? Or do you want to go to a school where the students wake up and think, how can I love the student next to me in the same way that Christ has loved me? Uh, it seems to me to be a far better uh, environment and also to tell kids that you're not an accident of some cosmic proportion, but to tell them they're designed purposefully by God who loves and cares for them. I can remember a few years ago, we had a young man come into my office. Uh, the teacher said he was crying hysterically, couldn't get him to stop. Um, you know, I, I can remember trying to, to talk to him and he slid across his journal to me. Uh, he opened it up, I opened it up and I read it and he said in his journal, he said, why did my mom choose drugs over me? Now, this is a young man who didn't have a father, whose mother obviously had an addiction problem. And I was able to hug him, pray for him, pray with him, and to explain to him that he has a father in heaven that loves him dearly, that his mother didn't choose drugs over him, that his mother is enslaved by a very powerful force, and that we need to be praying for her, and that his life ultimately needs to be honoring of her uh, by living out you know, the, the life that God has planned for him. I don't know that you could do that in an environment that wasn't Christian. Well, and I think it's important to note, and you've told me that, you don't have to, students don't have to be a Christian to go to your school. You no, have, they don't. You have we a always, wide variety of backgrounds who come right, to yeah. your school. We have Muslim students. Uh, we have non-Christian students. You know, our mantra to the parents is always, you know, you don't have to be a Christian to come here. Uh, our prayer is that you are when you leave. What else would you like to tell us about Cornerstone before we wrap up this part of... Um, well, the only thing I would say, I get people all the time that say, can't you do the religious part of your school after school or before school? I've got to tell you, our faith is fundamental to every minute of our day. Uh, it is our prayer to model out Christ's life for our students. It's not uncommon to walk down our hall and see students and teachers praying together, to see students and students praying together. It's not something that can be put off in a chapel service once a week. We really, we teach our kids uh, to know and love God. Uh, and to love one another in the same way that Christ loves us. And that means um, as much as you want to get a good grade, you want the student next to you to get a good grade. So if you were to go to Cornerstone today, you would see a student who struggles in math, and one of our graduates has come back to help him. And every day they're just on that board working together uh, because that student that graduated from Cornerstone loves him in the way that Christ loved him. Uh, and that's just the model. I think it's, it's indicative of who we are, and it's not something that can be separated out. And if you got rid of that, I think, you know, I, I just think it would be a disservice and we would ultimately have to close. And it's your faith that drives you to uh, serve in this way. Like we've been talking about this theme that we're chatting about. So let's move to Kelly. Hello, Kelly. Kelly is a volunteer with Bethany Christian Services, which is a faith-based adoption agency. And Kelly, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your family and, and, and your upbringing? So like perhaps many of you, I was raised in a middle class home, um, just like every other family. We, you know, have our, have our moments, but we just love each other. And I grew up going to, um, to church every Sunday. Now that didn't 
um, mean too much to me growing up. It was just something that, that I did. I got dressed up on Sunday and went with them and came home and um, it was a part of um, it was a part of my routine, but it wasn't necessarily um, a huge part of my life. Um, however, adoption was always a big part of my life for as long as I can remember because I wanted a sister really, really badly. And um, I am my parents' biological daughter, but for as long as I remember, um, I would always ask my parents, you know, well, when are we gonna have another baby? When are we gonna have another baby? And um, I didn't understand that my mom had a medical issue where she could not become pregnant again. And um, when she was adopted, my sister was adopted into our family. It was such an answer to prayer um, for my parents and for me. And um, so I just grew up very pro-adoption. Um, and um, I'm just grateful for my parents for that. Um, and sorry, in the spirit of gratitude, I just wanna say that this panel is amazing. And thank you, Carrie, for allowing me to have the opportunity to speak here. I just wanted to to say that each and every one of these panelists is um, just has such a sweet soul, and I'm just I'm so honored and humbled to be here. I never thought that um, something that I once thought of as something I would never talk about um, could be um, something that I'm sharing with you today that I'm talking about very publicly. So, um, but anyway, um, yeah, that's basically my family. I just. You know, I don't think of our family as much different than any of the other families, but I know that um, my parents had, and I had, an excess of love that we wanted to give to a child, and adoption allowed us to do that. And then at 18, you found yourself unexpectedly pregnant. So what was that like? Embarrassing. <laughs> um, I, my parents and I, we had um, volunteered at crisis pregnancy centers and I, you know, would work in a basement putting baskets together for women who um, were struggling with an unplanned pregnancy and I never thought that that would be my story. I, not at all. Um, so coming from the family that I came from, um, who raised me in the church, I was humiliated um, when I found out that I was pregnant. Um, being pregnant is supposed to be one of the happiest days of your life when you find out. And for me, um, I remember feeling like my life was flashing before my eyes. I thought of my parents' church and I thought of them and I thought of this, you know, the father of the baby that I had to tell and my classes and my professors, my sorority sisters, and I was like, this is so overwhelming and very embarrassing. Um, it was a huge reality check to the life that I was living away from, from Christ. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was definitely a very, very hard time. I don't sugarcoat that at all. Being a teenager and being pregnant um, is hard whether you come from a family with a religious background or not. But then you made a decision. I did. I made my decision um, the very first night that I found out I was pregnant. I was in my dorm room. I hadn't told anyone that I was pregnant yet. I was just bawling my eyes out and I, my life was flashing through my eyes and suddenly I had just a vision of my sister. Just as, as all of these thoughts are running through my mind, I just thought of my sister and her sweet face. And um, I can't explain it, but I just knew that I needed to make the decision that her birth mom had made. And it's weird because I had never had that respect for my sister's birth mom. I thought that she kind of just threw away her daughter, like she was trash or something, you know? And I was like, how could someone do that? My sister's so beautiful and sweet, and how could someone not want her? And um, for the first time, I was like, wow, people that make this decision, they're not evil. They're actually very loving, and they want better for their child. Um, so I, I made the decision to place my child for adoption that very first night. And you chose Bethany Christian Services. Why, why, why that agency? 
Um, I chose Bethany um, out of proximity, actually. I, um, people think that I chose Bethany because it was a Christian organization and I was raised Christian, but um, I Googled it. I didn't have a car. I, um, I wanted the closest possible one because I didn't want to inconvenience my friend that had to drive me on this mission. And, um, and we're in the car, I'm in the, dri the passenger seat, we're about halfway there, and I'm like, huh, Bethany Adoption Services. And I like looked down at my notes, it was like, Bethany Christian Adoption Services. And I'm like, oh my gosh, should we turn around? I don't know, they're gonna judge me, this is awful. What if, you know, one of my parents' friends are there? You know, I, all these thoughts are running through my mind. And, um, um, but I showed up and I was terrified. Um, and I walked in and I can honestly say that I was immediately met with respect and grace. And I know now that I was met with love, a love that I didn't deserve. Um, and my social worker, um, her name's Stacy, and um, she still works for Bethany now, but she's, she was incredible. She never pushed religion down my throat, but she, allowed me to have conversations with her that needed to happen. And when I broke down in her office one day and told her that God hated me, she looked at me and said, no, he doesn't. He loves you and he loves your baby. And he's gonna provide for both of you. And um, I don't know that that would have happened at a secular adoption agency. I don't know that that conversation could have happened there. And now you work with, you volunteer at that same agency that uh, you worked with so many years ago and you run a support group for birth mothers like yourself. And uh, so what's that experience like? Um, well, we actually have a meeting tonight. So if there's any birth moms in the room, drive down to Virginia Beach. Um, hopefully you can get through the traffic like I can. Um, but no, it's, been an amazing experience. Um, a lot of the birth moms, we, a lot of them do share the same faith. Um, some of them don't, and um, you know, really, it, it's a space where women can just be themselves. This is an experience that not a lot of women have, and to be in a space where you can be open and honest and vulnerable with people that aren't going to judge you that are just gonna listen and love on you is so important. And um, I can tell you that as an example, there's um, a woman in our group that has placed a child with a family that attends her same church. And so she discusses how difficult it can be sometimes to see her child every Sunday at church and what that looks like for her. On the other hand, I have a friend of mine who's a part of our birth mother support group who has zero contact with her birth child or the adoptive parents even though they had promised her contact. So I've walked with her through that struggle. So no adoption is similar. I don't pretend to be a spokesperson for all birth mothers. Um, my child and I, we have an open adoption. That's right for some birth moms and it's right for some adoptive families. It's not right for others. Um, every adoption is different but it's so important that as a facilitator, I can speak the same language that these women are speaking. And part of speaking that same language is understanding their faith background as well. Thank you for sharing that with us. You know, following this theme of service, Rabbi, I wanna jump back to you for a minute. And you've talked about how uh, your congregation engages in community relief, especially with respect to hurricanes, given your location. Right. Yeah, the Sunshine State is uh, also, uh, I guess, the hurricane center of the country. Um, because Chabad operates in a very decentralized manner, uh, we're able to be very quick on our feet um, in responding to natural disasters, uh, both locally and opening up outdoors um, for people to be able to come and get everything from, you know, basic needs to food, hot food, thank God for barbecues. Mm. Um, so we're able to provide that on a local level, but um, because of the global uh, footprint that we have, 
we're able to leverage that as well. So, for example, um, in the last hurricane, in the last uh, September, which affected Puerto Rico and a lot of the Caribbean islands, but mainly Puerto Rico, um, there were people who were frantically trying to locate family in Puerto Rico, which came to my attention. I happened to know that one of the only people on the island who had a functional phone, because it was a satellite phone, was my colleague in Puerto Rico, Rabbi Zarchi. So uh, through him, we were able to um, locate you know, relatives of people in Puerto Rico and give them you know, the peace of mind to know that they are um, alive and well. And so I think people, I don't know that the audience knows this, but you don't still have a building of your own. You're still meeting in a, in a rented space, isn't that correct? Yes, um, you know, we're still dealing with, um, well, it's what, what I've come to call the scenic route to our destination. <laughs> um, a lot more scenery than we anticipated, you know, since 2007. Um, and we're still dealing with that. But um, every day, you know, we're getting closer. Um, you know, the federal judge um, in one of the rounds had said that he sees no merit to this case other than um, religious animus. Um, so it's been pretty clear and it's been pretty uh, blatant. But um, I must say that many organizations have filed and constitutional lawyers have filed a Friends of the Court briefs um, on our behalf. And it's very reassuring for us to know that the Department of Justice is taking you know, such a proactive stance, particularly as it applies to Rilupa. In our case, an outside attorney was brought from New York who was known to be sort of a crusader against, uh, against Rilupa. And um, so it, it's, it's, I think it sends a very positive message throughout the country that the uh, you know, Department of Justice has got our back. I know that they have, the department has intervened. Actually, Attorney General Sessions referenced the case in New Jersey before, which is my brother-in-law, uh, in a place called Wycliffe Lake, New Jersey, who, like me, for 10 years has been in this perpetual you know, battle to be able to mm -hmm. Um, build the house of worship. So this 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 meeting and this again this proactive stance on behalf of the department is uh, I think a very positive message um, for us personally, and I think for the core values of uh, of this country. And my people come from all over the world, even from other liberal democracies, to you know to breathe the air of freedom um, in this country. Mm. I know the next panel is going to discuss uh, Arlupa and those cases involving religious land use and zoning and, and how, what that looks like. So we'll be hearing from some uh, legal experts and policy experts on that in just a bit. Harpreet, I want to turn to you. You're currently, and we only have a few minutes left, so we're going to wrap this up in, in the next few minutes. But uh, you're currently the national program manager for MASA. I mentioned that earlier. But I don't know if people know what MASA is. And that's uh, the Muslim, Arab, Sikh, and South Asian communities. And Hindu. And Hindu. Yes. And Hindu. Uh, so what are you hearing these days from the MASA community? Well, we're hearing a lot. We're hearing uh, that hate crimes and hate incidences are increasing. That's been substantiated by the FBI. Uh, even a recent study by the California State University Center for Study and Hate and Extremism did a survey of 10 major cities in the United States. Uh, and they reported that hate incidences were up 12.5%. Uh, and We've even seen recent studies in New York and California that show the same as well. Um, these studies show that there's a lot of underreporting going on. And it, I see and I interpret that as an opportunity for the Department of Justice to educate and uh, do a lot more hate crime prevention work that we are mandated to do at the uh, Community Relations Service. At the Community Relations Service, we are, if you don't know, um, we are a small component within the Department of Justice, but our mandate is to reduce community tension based on claims of discrimination on uh, race, color, national origin, religion, disability, and uh, gender, gender identity, and a few other jurisdictions. And with that, we mediate, we uh, conciliate, which is a less formal type of mediation. We provide training, we provide best practices. Uh, we have. Uh, 15 offices across the nation. Um, but what we do is we try to work with, uh, my role is w these communities in trying to be uh, a preventative piece in either organizing hate crimes forums or responding to unfortunate events like uh, the Victoria uh, 
uh, burning of the mosque. We, uh, as a response to that, we did a Protecting Places of Worship in Houston at Rice University with the interfaith community. And you uh, shared with me some gory examples of yeah, hate crimes and, as well. So yeah, maybe you want yeah, to share I mean, a couple of examples of those. The, I mean, we had worked on a case where, uh, uh, of course, the case last year with two Indian gentlemen in Kansas City were shot, one was murdered, and the other was severely wounded because of uh, the shooter thinking they were uh, terrorists. Um, we did a case in, uh, in Philadelphia where um, uh, the perpetrator had thrown a pig's head in front of a mosque. Mm. And we got together with law enforcement and did a, uh, a training and facilitated dialogue there. Um, we did another case with the Hindu community about two years ago where there was a Hindu sanctuary uh, of cows in, uh, in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, as you know, the Hindu community views uh, cows as sacred. And uh, the perpetrator had thrown a cow's head in front of this establishment. So we had worked with trying to, uh, uh, with law enforcement to, and the Hindu community to build a task force where they could work and have an ongoing relationship with law enforcement. And what we want to do is we want to promote communities to be educated about the resources out there. We want them to engage. We want them to collaborate with us, um, not only Department of Justice, but federal, local, and state officials. And we want them to report. And then um, at the end of the day, we want to promote more communication, that they don't view us as the other, and we don't view them as the other as well. Well, certainly, it seems like there's certainly a lot of work to be done, but we appreciate you Thank leading you. the charge on that here at the Department of Justice. And as we uh, close and we talk about this road ahead, Jack, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a tough question at you. Uh, it's a question that a lot of people are asking in this country. And as someone who just emerged from this Masterpiece Cake Shop case, uh, I'd like to get your thoughts. And, uh, so, and this is the question. So your opponents say that your particular stance in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case is not really about religious freedom, but it's a guise for dislike of a particular group of people, um, you know, masked within religious freedom. Now, your, your supporters say that a wedding uh, is a sacred teaching that is adhered to by Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and there are very distinct teachings about marriage. What's your response? Well, first of all, like I said, I serve everybody that comes to my shop regardless of their orientation, their religion, whatever, but I don't create cakes for every, every event that uh, people ask me for. And true tolerance then has to be a two-way street. Um, we just, um, we're thrilled that the, the court, the United States Supreme Court ruled in our favor with um, this ruling solidifying religious freedom in our, in our country. But it's not just for me, it's for all of us that we, every American should now be able to live and work freely according to their conscience without fear of punishment from the government. And Kelly, uh, as the next panel is going to talk about this, why do you think people choose faith-based adoption agencies? to two things, the first um, being convenience, the other being conviction. For me, it started out as convenience. I plugged it into Google. I needed some place that was close because I didn't have a car, and Bethany was the first one to pop up. If they were to close their doors, that's an, another city I would have had to have gone to, um, or at least an extra mile. So. That's one side of things. The other side is conviction. And um, for me and for many people that I've met along this adoption journey, um, infertility or just a want to adopt or being open to placing your child for adoption is not just a physical problem. It's also not just an emotional problem. For many women, and men who would like to adopt children, this is a spiritual issue as well. Um, to to come against faith-based adoption agencies is to come against 
any man or woman who has chosen to place a child for adoption or to adopt a child into their family from a place of faith. It's coming against them. And it's really not, it's not fair. We should be standing up for these people that have made an adoption decision from a place of faith. And Harpreet, I'm gonna give you the last question. <laughs> the last word. You, you like to say you are a Sikh 24 seven. What does that mean? Well, um, well, on one hand, it means that, you know, I can't hide from my faith. I wear it proudly. But it also means that uh, the Sikh ideals are very similar to American ideals. I'm, American ideals being uh, equality, uh, the service of country, community service, uh, pluralism, and religious freedom and liberty. So I hold those ideals very closely, and I try to um, do whatever I can with those as my motivating factor in moving, ser in moving forward in my service. So I think that's it, and I think in the, in the Sikhs were created as a helping hand, as kind of a, uh, a, beak, a, a beacon of light that, hey, if you see a Sikh or a Sikh man with a turban and beard, that's a place where you can get a meal or, or you know, a pat on the back or a blanket or a, a, some safety and to help the downtrodden. And so with those principles, those combined principles, uh, they really give me motivation and, and uh, health to continue uh, to do what I can. And then at the end of the day, compassion and tolerance for others and to understand that, hey, my views might be different than yours, but we can definitely sit down, break bread, and learn from each other. Very well said. Would you join me in thanking our panelists today?